why Garbo's the gentlest jailer ever to gouge a prisoner's eye. Welcome back to my dark corner of this sick world. And pray that I may never turn my interest upon you. <laughs> the Undead is one of a handful of Roger Corman films, which include Attack of the Crab Monsters and Little Shop of Horrors, scripted by Charles B. Griffith. Thou art the author of the piece. Films which are cheap and badly made, but are saved by their utter madness. They say the enchantment has destroyed my reason. This one was originally written in iambic pentameter. Tell what you mean and speak clearly. Following a brief introduction by the devil, Here is a story of my eternal work. We meet mad hypnotist Quintus, who doesn't just regress people to their past lives. And the regression is physical as well as mental. He transports them there. And where will you find a subject weak and impressionable enough to arrive in the required depth of trance? Diana. Prostitute Diana Love doesn't get a lot of respect. Her type is the most easily influenced of basic character groups and almost devoid of willpower. That's why I chose one of her class. I'm right here. Although I dare say she has no idea what I'm paying her for. And she arrives in her past life at a bad moment. How fares the witch? And things get weirder. And make thy final night a pleasure. Yay! Don't back away. Obi-Wan? What voice is that I hear? It's me, you, both of us. Well, that's cleared that up. Diana, now called Helen, escapes, and much of the rest of the movie is a back-and-forth game of hide-and-seek across a version of medieval England that seems to be about a mile across because it was shot in a disused supermarket. I meet thee everywhere. Helen is not a witch, but Livia, played by soon-to-be 50-foot woman Alison Hayes, is the best-dressed witch in the Middle Ages. <laughs> and can turn into an owl, an iguana for some reason, a cat, and one of the monsters left over from It Conquered the World. At the other end of the witch scale is Meg Maud. Perhaps I'll turn thee into an owl to catch mice for my cauldron. One step away from a gingerbread house. I have some conjuring to do. Livia is trying to kill Helen so she can get Pendragon, which, by the way, is how it's pronounced. First Pendragon, give to me thy gift of one embrace, no more, to warm the chill upon this witch's heart. The plot now seems to be settling down to something sensible almost pedestrian, and so... What is it that you fear? Quintus, concerned for Diana's safety in a way he certainly wasn't earlier, uses her mind as a link to go back in time himself. According to certain priests in Nepal, I could follow her. Arriving naked as a Terminator. <laughs> although still retaining his watch. The rational mind can accept just so much. Meanwhile, at the witch's sabbat, Satan offers to save Helen for Pendragon, but for a price. And thou must sell thy soul. He is then saved by Quintus, who suggests the rental option. Don't sell Pendragon, rent him your soul. Save for a month. Take it for a test drive, you'll thank me later. So, Quintus, you have slipped at last the bonds of time. You'd think Quintus would register some surprise at meeting Satan. And to think I'd never believed in witches. Now I just accept pretty much whatever. I'll have known the most intriguing drama of my life. No kidding, because now there's the question of timelines to sort. What is it? Her past, we've altered it. Diana Love and all the lives Helene would have lived will end. That is, they will never be born at all. This wibbly-wobbly, timey-wimey stuff gives the film's conclusion an unexpected pathos as Helene must choose between life with Pendragon now, followed by eternal death, and death now, followed by infinite future existences, who now speak to her through the centuries, begging for their lives. Give me life. I am a mother. Give me life. I am a dancer. Give me life. I am happy. Give me life. Which I found quite moving. Unlike Quintus's attitude, which I found quite confusing. I am not a cruel man, but I can't help being fascinated. He doesn't care about Diana. A wanton woman of the streets. But goes back in time to save her. 
If she does not die where and when she really did in the unchanged past, she'll die now. Then becomes gleefully interested in what happens when you tear time apart. And frankly, I don't much care which course you take. For which he is properly punished. As with all films that mess with timelines, this doesn't hold up to scrutiny. Death now, life after. Life now, death ever. And like most of the Corman Griffith collaborations, this is cheap, badly made rubbish. It's nothing but Sunday supplement nonsense. But it's tongue in cheek. Time has little meaning in Tibet. Alison Hayes is having the time of her life. I smell eight quarts of human blood that will soon enrich the grasses here. And if you can't enjoy a past-life time-travelling film with ghost dancers... <laughs> ...beheadings... And a head is needed for the Sabbath. <laughs> ...and a dime-store devil... Behold the subtle working of my talents. ...then you're watching the wrong show. Excuse me, did I say nonsense? Oh, and I've no idea why it's called The Undead. Horrible, horrible choice. Thanks for watching. See all of our Roger Corman film reviews here. Screenwriter Charles B. Griffith's films are always worth watching. Are there any other screenwriters whose name alone is enough to make you watch a film? Let us know in the comments below. Say, how much longer am I going to have to stay in this crummy joint?